Etruscan is a dead language. It's as dead as it gets, it's as extinct as it gets. Not only has it had no native speakers for possibly the last 2,000 years, it isn't written or read or spoken or used in any way by anyone in the modern age. It has no living descendants, and the inscriptions we have aren't even fully deciphered and understood. Etruscan is a closed case, easy to classify. But all dead languages are not so cold in their graves. To talk about these undead tongues, I'd like to introduce today's special guest, the reptile of languages himself, L Ling Lingo Lizard. The main way that languages go extinct, especially in the modern era, is through a different language gaining dominance in the region, and leaving people with little reason to speak the minority language. Parents don't pass the language down to their children, and it slowly loses speakers until there are none left. But what happens if one of these languages goes extinct and gets revived? This is exactly what happened with Manx. Manx is a Celtic language native to the Isle of Man between Ireland and Britain. The language was thriving until around the 1700s, when English was made the primary language of the island. It was used in most schools, and English became the only language that made sense to use for economic purposes. The last Manx speaker, Ned Mosrell, died in 1974, but before this happened, the revitalization movement already started. People took to interviewing the last native speakers in order to see how they spoke, and some adult activists were learning it as second language speakers. The revitalization movement has only gotten more prevalent since then. Now there are over 2,000 second language speakers of Manx, there are Manx immersion schools, adults are using the language informally, children are using it in play, and there may be a few native speakers of Manx once more. Manx is very much a revived language, one that went extinct but has been brought back to life, and can hardly be considered a dead language anymore. This is practically a textbook example of an undead language, and the biggest example of linguistic necromancy would be with Hebrew. Though there is a case to be made for calling Manx undead even without any first language speakers. A dormant language is one that has no native speakers, but is still used by a community or ethnic group associated with it. In the case of Manx, it was still being learned and preserved for cultural purposes even as its last native speaker was dying. If there's a significant community of learners and people interested in it, can a language really be labeled dead or extinct just because there are no natives left? After all, if modern standard Arabic has no native speakers, does that make it a dead language? Speaking of which... Classical Arabic is a great example of a liturgical language, one that is used primarily for religious purposes within a community, in this case, the Muslim community. Other liturgical languages include Sanskrit for Hinduism, Church Slavonic for Eastern Orthodoxy, and there's like an important one in Christianity, I, I can't remember right now. One of the things these have in common is that they have no native speakers, meeting the base level criteria for being extinct, or at least being dead. While a liturgical language doesn't necessarily have to be dead, when a religion or set of beliefs continues to be practiced for hundreds and even thousands of years, that sacred language used at its inception is likely to fade away or diverge into different languages. The latter happened to Classical Arabic. While Classical Arabic was used in the early Islamic caliphates both officially and in daily life, Arabic nowadays is split into many varieties that have been diverging from each other since the inception of Islam in the 7th century. These varieties, or dialects if you feel like calling them that, are often noticeably different from Classical Arabic and from each other. What makes things more complicated is that Arabs tend to know another variety of Arabic, Modern Standard Arabic, or MSA for short, which is used in formal contexts like politics, news, and science. MSA is also heavily based on Classical Arabic, to the point where it mostly just adds more vocabulary to describe modern concepts. Most Arabs consider them to be form of the same language, both called al fusha translating roughly as the purest, the most elegant. When distinguished, Classical Arabic is called Fusa al turath meaning heritage Fusa, and MSA is called Fusa al-Asr, modernized Fusa. While the modern varieties of Arabic have taken over use in daily life, and MSA has taken the role of official language, Classical Arabic is still the language of the Quran, sometimes being called Quranic Arabic. While again, it has no native speakers, Classical Arabic still plays an important role in Muslim society today, and can hardly be considered fully extinct. But on the topic of liturgy, we're leaving out a pretty obvious example of a language that has been used for a long time by specific Christian churches in readings and ceremonies. I'm talking, of course, about Coptic. Coptic is used by the Copts, 
an ethno-religious group of North African Christians who are now mostly native to Egypt. Linguistically, it is an Afro-Asiatic language, the most recent development of the Egyptian language, so it's a direct descendant of ancient Egyptian. It's used as a liturgical language by both the Coptic Orthodox and Coptic Catholic churches, so it remains in daily usage, but is cited as having no native speakers today. So, there you go. It's a dead language, but there's remnants in the church. Pretty simple, right? Well, there are some things that make Coptic stand out from the likes of Sanskrit or Quranic Arabic. It's a bit unclear when the language actually disappeared from popular usage. Some sources, like James Allen's description of the dialects of Coptic, state that it was spoken until perhaps sometime in the 17th century. Other writers like Samuel Rubinson insist that Coptic was well and truly dead by the 13th century, at which point he writes, Coptic was already a classical language known only by those who studied it from preserved texts. That's a difference of 400 years. Then there are reports that would suggest there were active speakers of the language in the late 19th century. M mind you, these accounts are a little shaky, but they would make Coptic attested far closer to the modern day than other authors say, which would in turn make the wildest claims surrounding the language much more believable, that this dead language is not actually dead. This blog post from 2011 claims that there are somewhere under 300 people who still use this language as their daily vernacular tongue. This website link here, by the way, doesn't work anymore, and I can't find that stat anywhere else on the internet. No hate to Caroline, I just mean I can't confirm this. No one can, as far as I'm aware. Numerous blogs and forum posts cite this newspaper article from the Daily News Egypt, which says that Coptic remains the spoken language of only two families in Egypt, and gives us the story of Mona Zaki, a woman who still speaks a colloquial Coptic every day. Here we have direct names and details, which means we can dig deeper, but all we find when we look up Mona Zaki is a famous Egyptian actress who isn't even Coptic, by the way. I mean, two people can have the same name, that's not inherently odd, but this strange detail made me do a double take. I mean, it's not like this article cites any sources. I mean, hang on, it, it it doesn't cite any sources or any anything. Actually, as far as I'm aware, this is a fairly trusted newspaper source, but, you know, who, who is this guy who wrote this article? Where did he get his facts? Who is this, uh, Joseph Mayton? Well, I'm going to go ahead and guess he's the same Joseph Mayton referenced in this article. A freelance reporter based in Egypt who contributed opinion pieces to The Guardian. Well, it's not actually accurate to call it an article, it's actually uh, an apology piece from The Guardian stating that Mayton's opinion pieces had been taken down after an extensive independent review because he made up all his evidence, like, all the time. This doesn't prove that his articles for Daily News Egypt were fabrications, of course, but... A journalist known for inventing fake quotes and fake sources and fake people making up a fake source and fake quotes and fake people isn't exactly unthinkable, is it? None of this disproves that Coptic exists. Humans are not as well documented as we often like to believe. They're called population estimates for a reason. There might be Coptic speakers left in some villages, especially considering the revitalization efforts that took place during the 20th century. Who's to say that some Coptic nationalists didn't raise their kids with Coptic? Although the movement to revive the language has generally been deemed a failure in academia, maybe one person kept it going. Now that's no substitute for empirical evidence. I think in its absence we have to assume that the language is dead, that there are no native speakers. But here, in the way we speak about these languages, we loop back around to that question about definitions. Why are those things seen as the same? A language being dead, and a language having no native speakers. Well, the obvious answer is that we have defined it like that. The Oxford Dictionary of Linguistics, for instance, tells us that a dead language is one that is no longer the native language of any community. But why do we use that specific word, dead, for a language like this? Death implies something final. But there is nothing final about Coptic's demise. It's there. It's in everyday use in churches. It's in writing. I think this is something that can be carried over to the way we view many dead languages. Where revival is often thought of as digging up an old artifact, dragging it into the modern day, cleaning it up, restoring it. Really, there is an alternative view, where the dead language is holding on, bubbling up, waiting to be pulled back to the surface. This is in no way meant to minimise the difficulties of reviving a language, the work that goes into it, or the very 
real and permanent language extinction events taking place across the globe, but we cannot merely see languages as things that either live or die. This binary will end up hindering our analyses rather than providing insights into how language knowledge actually works. People know scraps of language. Some can have a very good ear for what is right or wrong without being quote-unquote native speakers. Sometimes languages just keep existing, like classical Arabic, or that other language I can't think of, or evolve into new forms. Sometimes languages lie dormant, and sometimes they get woken up again. It's happening to Manx, and maybe it will happen to Coptic.